Battleground Productions presents Brass, the audio serial, episode one, Arrivals. The year is 1885, but not one that would be familiar to you. For this is a 19th century that differs in many ways from the one in our history books. For one thing, the skies over England feature any number of elegant airships, including this one, the Lord Byron, whose gondola gleams in the late afternoon sun with the brilliance of a medal on the chest of a war hero. In a stately cabin sits a distinguished looking gentleman wearing a jeweler's loop and holding a pair of infinitesimally small tweezers, which he is using on an exquisite gold pocket watch laid out on the desk before him. With the greatest delicacy, he lifts an escape wheel a hair's breadth above its casing when. Blast! Enter! Father? Yes, sir. Oh, you're working. Just making an adjustment to the chronometer. Is the time off? Of course not. But I noted the atmospheric pressure slightly altered the temperature analysis device. <laughs> Unless you believe this cabin is 28 degrees Celsius. <laughs> Doubtful, Father. It is extraordinarily difficult to build any device that accounts for all environmental factors, my boy. So what's the solution? The same as dealing with any problem. Analysis, ingenuity, and adaptability of circumstance. Speaking of which, how go your studies? Oh, uh, all right, I suppose. What's the matter? I went to some lengths to supply you with that reading list. Several of those books are considered contraband in much of Europe. Oh, there's only so much you can learn about fighting from yet another treatise. Nonsense. Silver's the man for you, my boy. Good old English swordsmanship with none of that Italian or Spanish frippery. So you say. But I like the occasional frippery. Why couldn't we have stayed in Paris just a few days more? For one thing, between you and your sister, we were in danger of investing our entire fortune into Parisian fashions. For another, our job was done. Old Dupin himself said he couldn't have solved the case with any greater alacrity and style. He was a pleasant old duffer. I liked his story about the orangutan. <laughs> yes, he was quite the raconteur. Though that habit of his of always saying what one was thinking got on your mother's nerves somewhat. <laughs> Anyone who claims to be a detective gets on mother's nerves. <laughs> that much is true. But Cyril, as grand as Paris was, aren't you looking forward to a bit of break from adventure? We can't spend every day leaping across the rooftops of Paris in pursuit of jewel thieves. Why not? In my case, my knees. In your case, my lad. You are in the flower of your youth, and like a wriggling pup I know that you must have exercise or you'll simply mope about. But a trained body's little use without a trained mind, Cyril. You habitually neglect your studies in pursuit of excitement. I, I learn by doing, father. Yes, yes. But do you have to pursue your studies into quite so many disreputable taverns? Your mother is concerned about some of the company you've been keeping. I wasn't looking for friends. I was looking for fights. And you found quite a few, didn't you? <laughs> I'll say I did. Those Parisian toughs were good for a proper dust-up or two. Though those so-called Apaches were nowhere near as fearsome as I had been led to believe. And their fashion sense is appalling. Bell pants and open jerseys? What are they thinking? Criminals are rarely noted for their sartorial sense. Well, more's the pity, I say. Where are the dashing bandits of your father? Even those wretched Thuggees we fought back in India had those lovely yellow scarves. That they used to strangle their victims. Now, is there a reason for your visit aside from filial affection? Uh, the captain says we'll be in London in two hours and we should dress for our reception. Reception? We are to be met by several dignitaries. Oh, Lord. What has your mother said? I've yet to tell her. No doubt she knows already. Mm. What did your sister say? She grunted. Grunted? She had a nose in a book. Go remove her nose from said book and ask her what she wants. Is she still wearing that sack thing from Morocco? Uh, the banous, yes. She says it's comfortable. Too comfortable for her to be seen wearing it in public. Honestly, for such a pretty young woman she gets into the most disagreeable tempers. That's one thing I'll say for you, Cyril. Despite your proclivity towards violence, you're remarkably sanguine. 
Thank you, Father. Now I suppose I'll have to look up sanguine to find out what it means. And that's precisely why I used it. Oh, Lord. London. After over two years of missing it, I scarcely find any enthusiasm for our return. Why, Father? London, my boy, is my home. I was born within the sound of bow bells, and I am a Londoner down to my marrow. Even though I packed that away with my childhood when I became an agent for Her Majesty, there's no city on earth that I love more. But London is also the root of so much of the trouble that has plagued our lives. The vital heart of the Empire, and yet the source of so much misery. Misery, Father? Well, perhaps. But it's also brought prosperity to many, and the rule of law to even more. Surely the people we have met and helped free from evils, war, and oppression might agree. That's a fair point. Our empire has accomplished much and shall do more to free the world from the excesses of vice and evil. Yet, I am wearied of its defense. But <laughs> father, what other life could you possibly imagine? One that might leave me time to be in my lab with my experiments. The world is alive with mystery and intrigue, but I tire of experiencing it all firsthand. That's the only way for me. Preferably with a scrap or two involved. <laughs> Since you were a child, you've been up for a scrap, Cyril. So I was in my youth, and no doubt I'll weather a few more before I hang up my hat, holster, and toolbox. I can certainly tell you this. I'd take any sort of scrap in preference to yet another official reception. Tell the captain that we are honored, but shall unfortunately not be able to attend. No, oh, he won't like that. One of the advantages of being a peer of the realm, my boy, is you can refuse practically any invitation for a social event that you choose. Tell him we have business elsewhere. Elsewhere? You, your sister and your mother at home, and I in my workshop. Or, even better, at my club. One of the only things I've truly missed is a good cigar, a brandy, and the view of a stoked fire from a large leather armchair. Lord Brass. What is it? Message for you, sir. Just arrived by a carrier pigeon. All right, Stuart. Give it here. Thank you, Stuart. Apparently we're going to that reception after all, sir. Oh, why? A peer of the realm may refuse an invitation from practically anyone, with the exception of the Prime Minister or royalty. Apparently, both parties will be present this evening. Very well. Do you happen to have a cravat that will go with my gold-brocaded waistcoat? Uh, several, Father. Steward, send me my man with the shaving kit, and send a response pigeon to say that we shall be... delighted to attend. Yes, sir. Cyril... Go ransack your wardrobe, then lay out a choice of cavats on my bed. Let's hope the Prime Minister has gotten over his distressing propensity for aspic. We had it with every cause at the last state dinner. As Cyril leaves his father, on the observation deck, Lady Brass finds her daughter Gwendolyn slouched in a deck chair and immersed in a book. Gwendolyn? Hmm? Did you just grunt at me? I grunted, Mother, but it wasn't directed at you. What are you reading? Balzac. Oh, dear. The wild ass's skin. Even worse. If you must fill your head with romantic fantasy, could you at least not make it a French novel? What's wrong with the French? Nothing within the boundaries of France, where they are très jolie et charmante. If only they would all stay there. Mother! You're a xenophobe. Nonsense, my dear. I'm British. I am hospitable to any people who pay proper fealty to the Queen and Union Jack. Now, put down that book and come to my room. We need to dress for our arrival. Why? There's going to be some sort of reception when we land. I intimated it from the degree of preparation going on near the gangway. I'm perfectly comfortable. You're perfectly hideous. Thank you. Oh, my dear, you're a beautiful young woman, but... Even you can't make that burnous appealing. I like it, and I intend to go on wearing it. You do not like it. Yes, I do. No, you don't. You're wearing it to keep young Ensign Fairweather at a distance, particularly as you fear he's on the verge of proposing to you. You know, it is tiresome having the world's greatest detective as one's mother. Don't be silly. I'm not the world's greatest detective. Oh, I know that everyone thinks that. Yes. 
let's not talk about him. In any case, I understand. Fair weather is presentable enough if you enjoy a dashing mean and an athletic build, but he has a weakness for gambling, a fondness for tobacco, and the acquired characteristics for gout. You can do better. Firstly, I only knew two of those things, and neither of them bothered me. And secondly, the real problem with Ensign Fairweather is that he is just like every other young man who has ever pitched woo to me, which is to say, not very intelligent. You are a brass, dear girl. You can and do have higher standards. <laughs> a fat lot of good they do me. Frankly, dear mother, I sometimes believe that due to the exquisite genetic characteristics of you and father, I am doomed to be a solitary genius. Gwendolen. I understand. My courting years were an absolute misery. Every man I met had an infinite capacity to bore me, and I had no facility in disguising it. Thank heavens I am at least a passable actress. Earlier this afternoon I had to assume an attentive air where that bore Mr. Crawford went on and on about his crop investments in West Africa. Don't be modest, dear. It's an affectation. You are a superbly gifted actress as well as a mistress of disguise. Yet another of my blighted ambitions. What? I am at an age where I should be enjoying a career on the stage, but where am I? Stuck on some airship with a dashing young officer flinging his woo at me. While other children were getting properly socialised, I was abducted by a pair of ne'er-do-well adventurers and inducted into the shadowy world of espionage. Abducted? Inducted? Rubbish. Oh, please, Mummy, I cannot bear to be left behind when you two are yet again travelling the world. We hadn't the heart to send you back to boarding school after you had escaped for the third time. And now we return to London with my career in tatters and my visage drawn with cares and woes, aged before my time. You are a perfectly lovely young woman of twenty-two. Forced yet again to peddle my faded charms amidst an unending current of moronic fops and inbred aristocrats. Gwendolen, that's quite enough. You are going to come with me now and pick out a dress suitable for a society reception, and by that I mean something not made out of wool, not usually worn by Berbers, and definitely not featuring a hood. I won't have a daughter of mine allowing herself to fall prey to such ridiculous self-pity. All right. But, Mother? Yes. They are all so very, very dull. That's exactly what I thought, my dear. Absolutely all of them. That is, until I met your father. Good afternoon, Lady Brass. Good afternoon, Mr Crawford. I expect you and your daughter are excited to be so close to returning home, yes? Parties, soirees, all that sort of ladylike entertaining that fills the gentle sex with such raptures. Ecstatic. As am I. As for me personally, I'm looking forward to getting back to my office and telling my partners about our mining interests. Now, I don't know if your daughter mentioned, but I was off looking after my crop investments. A miraculous mineral crop does the most extraordinary things, which reminds me, I was hoping to talk to your husband about... Uh, by any chance, have you seen a steward? I have. Only moments ago. Hang on. What ho there, steward? Yes, sir. Oh, there you are. Lady Brass here requires your assistance. Steward, go tell my husband that we have gone to prepare for the reception and we'll see him on the gangway just prior to our docking. Certainly, madam. Well, let's prepare. Thank you, Mr Crawford. Oh, no problem, my lady. And if you could mention to your husband... Quop? Yes. Fascinating. Mother, at least help me avoid fair weather. The soppy moon cough has been trying to throw himself at my feet every ten minutes. And with his incipient gout. How noble. Oh, steward. Yes, sir. What's the word? When we dock, the minister wants to catch them, just as they're leaving the ship. With how many men? I have a half dozen, armed with cutlasses. Dick. Cutlasses. Firearms are contraband on an airship, sir. Myself, I've got a smart little gas pistol. Fires poison darts, so I can take one of them out right away. Make it Lord Brass. He's the tactician. Very well. 
What sort of poison on the darts? Curare, medicinal grade, leads to paralysis in seconds. Death from asphyxiation within a minute. Mm. Make sure it's point blank. And aim for his neck. You want to hit an artery. Now, how many agents on the ground? Six. How are they armed? Rifles. They'll begin firing as soon as they reach the gangway. Uh, these better not be your typical nobblers and neddy men. We need marksmen who know what they're doing. I was told that they were the men you'd hand-picked. They better be. If you don't mind me saying, sir, all of this seems a bit excessive. Excessive? Once I take care of Lord Brass, we're only talking about a woman and her two grown children, and will have the element of surprise. Perhaps, but they'll still have the advantage. What advantage? It's the family brass, you fool! That's the, all the advantage they need. As the great airship flies over the golden fields of Kent towards London, what will be the result of this sinister conspiracy? Join us in one week as we once again visit with the first family of the realm, Brass. Brass is manufactured by Battleground Productions. For credits and more information on our show, go to battlegroundproductions.org and find us on Facebook.